This dividend aristocrat has increased their dividend for 67 consecutive years. How's that for reliability? But the best part is it's finally in the cheap buy range for value investors. Watch this video to learn more. Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGrass, the Fundamentals Analyzer Software Tool, a.k.a. Mr. Valuation. I've got a really interesting stock for you to look at today. This stock is going to be oriented to people who are looking for reliable, predictable, and safe long-term dividend income and dividend income growth. So I think that's the specific strategy that you should look at this company for. Now, I've got some bonuses at the end of this video, so you want to be sure to watch the whole video where I'm going to show some additional companies as a bonus that are in the same sector that are more aggressive and more you know suitable maybe for people who are willing to take a little more risk and looking for a higher total return. But let's get into the video utilizing the FastGraphs Fundamentals Analyzer software tool and analyze genuine parts company. What I'm going to do here is show you how the FastGraphs Fundamentals Analyzer software tool is such a powerful fundamental analyzer and how dynamically it can be utilized to make sounder, better, long-term profitable decisions. If you don't have fast graphs and you invest in common stocks, I think you're making a big mistake. But anyway, let's start with the fast graphs. The first thing we have on the picture here is Genuine Parts Company. And I've got the earnings per share plotted going all the way back to 2003. And I want you to notice some things about this. By the way, these gray shaded areas, this is the recession of 08 and this is COVID. All right. So what you have here is a company whose earnings were kind of growing nicely, you know, 11%, 11%, 10% and 8%. And then we came into the recession of 08. And then we had negative 2%, negative 4%. So we saw a little law here, but we still saw very profitable, you know, the company still earned $2.50 a share. And I want you to notice that all through this recession, they raised their dividend each year, even though the earnings waned a little bit. And following that, they had some pretty good earnings growth. Again, a little bit of slowdown in 2013 and a flat growth in 2015 and negative in 2016. So you see this flat spot. Then earnings accelerated by 22% growth. And then we kind of came into COVID and we actually had another negative year in 2020. But what I also want you to note here is how the earnings growth is really accelerating for the next couple of years and still looks like it's going to be strong at, you know, a, a good rate going forward. Okay. The orange line in this graph is our valuation reference line, and it represents 15 times the company's adjusted operating earnings. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring weekly closing stock prices into the equation. And I want you to note how they track the earnings line. But I also want you to note that when the stock price, the black line, is above the orange line, these are periods of high valuation. And you can, of course, because of the dynamic ability of fast graphs, you can scroll along the stock price and see different P.E. ratios at different dates. Then it got really overvalued in 2007 as we kind of entered the Great Recession. And then as earnings began to flatten and weaken, we saw the stock price, of course, drop. And and this was one of the few times that you could have bought this stock at below the 15 fair value P.E., which would represent a 6.67% earnings yield. Then it immediately recovered as we came out of the recession. But then we went through a period of years here from, you know, 2013, coming into COVID in 2020, so roughly seven years here, where we saw really high valuation. And then we had the flash crash of COVID. So the stock fell precipitously. It dropped, you know, down to a low of actual, if you look at the high and low here, a low of $49.68. But then once earnings began to recover, we saw the stock price rally. But here's the beauty. In 2023, you know, the stock kind of peaked in December of 2022. And then we had a correction through most of 2023. You know, this is October of 2023. We saw a correction of about 31%. Now, what that correction means is this stock that had been fully valued, overvalued all during this time, this marvelous dividend aristocrat that's increased its dividend by, you know, 67 consecutive years, the stock then got overvalued. And now I've got a normal P.E. ratio over this time frame was we'll call it 18, 17.97. That's what the multiple of the blue line is. So again, when the stock price is below that, it's at trading at a lower multiple. 
When it's above that, it's trading at a higher multiple. And this kind of 15 to 18 range here gives you what I would call a fair and reasonable value for this stock. But of course, I like the 15 because that also indicates a bit of a margin of safety. Now, I want you to note the genuine parts has only been available at a 15 times earnings number occasionally. And it's currently trading at 15.22, has an earnings yield of 6.57, fully within the range that I like as Mr. Valuation. It offers an above market dividend yield of 2.68%. And I want to remind you, this company's increased its dividend for 67 consecutive years. So let's bring the dividend line in with the dividend payout ratio. That's the white line on this graph. Now, I want to make a point. This stock I'm looking at as an interesting candidate for those investors who are looking for safety, predictability, reliability, and consistent dividend growth. Okay, it's not the highest potential rate of return investment you can look at, but it's very, very predictable. The white line, of course, is the most predictable line on the graph, and that's the dividend with the dividend payout ratio. The area below the white line is the dividend payout ratio. The black line is the weekly closing stock prices, and you can see stock price volatility is something that's unavoidable. The question is to recognize when the market is overvaluing a stock, when it's undervaluing a stock, or when it's valuing a stock fairly or correctly. That's the beauty of having a tool like Fastgrass. So now we're finally seeing, after all these years of overvaluation, this stock has come into fair value. And for those of you who are looking for reliable, consistent dividend income, you know, it looks very, very attractive. So since it is a dividend stock, there are several different machinations that I like to run it through utilizing Fastgrass. So first of all, I've got adjusted operating earnings. Now, I can look at gap earnings or diluted earnings, and this is, you know, a company that makes a lot of acquisitions. So, you know, occasionally you can see gap numbers you know, drop off a little bit, but a lot of these, this contains a lot of non-cash charges and so on. But the stock looks very attractive on a gap basis or diluted earnings basis. But since it's a dividend stock, I'm going to take price off of the graph here because I'm not really interested in price at this point. What I am interested in is I'm looking at operating cash flow. And what I want to see is how safe is the dividend continuing to be. Remember, they've raised it for 67 consecutive years. Well, operating cash flow has been significantly higher than the white line, which is the dividend. And you see that down here in the number. In 2022, which was the last completed year, we'll be getting a report on 2023 shortly, we had $10.31 of operating cash flow covering a $3.58 dividend. And you can see that the orange line has been above the white line throughout. Now, the real asset test, I like to say, the free cash flow line is also very encouraging for this dividend growth stock because free cash flow has always covered the dividend as well. Of course, not by as much because the free cash flow is what's left over after everything they you know, needed to spend to run the business. All right. And so free cash flow is covering the dividend. Now, the stock is investment grade. It's triple B rated and it only has 46 percent debt. And we'll get into that here in a moment. But then I also like to look at another cash flow related metric, which is EBITDA. And with EBITDA, I do like to check price. And as you can see, the stock has traded at about 10 times EBITDA very consistently. You can now buy it at 9.19 times EBITDA. And the EBITDA yield is almost 11%. So I think that's, from a valuation point of view, that's also very, very attractive. Now, I can also look at EBIT, but I'm going to just for sake of time skip that. I'm also going to look at price to sales. This stock has historically traded at eight times sales. The orange line on this graph represents 0.82 times sales, not eight times sales, less than one time sales. Okay, 0.82 times sales. Right now it's trading at 0.85 times sales. So you could call that, you know, fully valued based on a price to sales basis, but it's still well within the range that a value investor should be attracted to this company. Now, a couple other things I like to do when I'm doing this, I like to go into as I'm analyzing a stock. And again, the reason I'm analyzing this stock is because the price has now come in to where I can buy it and look at it as a fair value investment, as a value investor for the first time in years. And, you know, I'm basing that really on the operating earnings number. The PE, the price earnings ratio has been you know, too high to attract me for all these years. And it was also a period where growth wasn't so strong either. All right, but now what we're going to do is we're going to look at some other places to look at. So I'm going to go into fund graphs, and this stands for financial underlying numbers. And I do want to look at the balance sheet, and I do want to look at 
things like long-term debt, okay, and then I want to look at total debt. And what I want you to note here is that most of their debt is long-term. Now, they have taken on more debt in you know, recent years after COVID than they historically have. But if I go to the quarterly number here, I want you to notice that, let me, um, let me take long-term debt off for a while. I want you to notice that, you know, debt, they're beginning to reduce the debt a little bit, but the debt is fully manageable for a company of this size. Now, I also like to go into fiscal fitness. And what I want to see is, I want to see free cash flow greater than the dividend, which we already talked about that. And clearly, the green bar here is free cash flow. The purple is the dividend. And we see that the free cash flow is covering the dividend. I also like to see operating cash flow greater than net income. And we also see that, you know, the net operating cash flow is the red and the net income is the green. You know, sales revenue, I do want to see it positive. It's been growing at about 9% since 2021 in recent years. And then I also want to look at the all-important margins. All right, I'm looking here at operating margin. Gross margin has been about 34.77%. Operating margin, about 8%. Then net margin has been about 6%. And net margin, I want you to note here, has been increasing. So these are all positive signs of the quality of this company. Okay, now, just for sake of this video, I would also go in the financial statement. I would look at through the income statement, the cash flow statements. I would do more research as I'm examining. But again, for the sake of this video, let's kind of keep it simple here. All right, so what I conclude from this is that I've got a company here with a great dividend record. So let's go into performance and let's look at it from performance. Now, going from the max that I can do on fast graphs, that goes back to January 3rd, 2003, to January 24th, 2024, okay? And what I see, if I compare this to the S&P 500, a couple of things really strike me. Number one is the company has generated twice the income of the S&P 500. It's also generated slightly more capital appreciation than the S&P 500. And it's also generated a total compounded return that's greater than the S&P 500. But since this is a dividend video, the fact that it raises so much more dividends than the S&P. Now, I can also reinvest the dividends and evaluate that if I don't need the money. And then we get a really great you know, advantage over the S&P. Look at the dividend income that we've reinvested versus reinvesting dividends in the S&P. And then the total return is substantially better than the S&P. So, you know, the company actually has been. But now keep in mind, one thing I've always talked about is that the valuation, measuring performance without simultaneously measuring valuation to job half time. This company started out fairly valued and has now ended fairly valued. So with a 7.5% growth rate, what I want you to notice is that's almost exactly what the company, without reinvesting dividends here, that's almost exactly what the company generated in terms of annualized rate of return without the dividend. And the point about value investing is when you buy a stock at fair value, you position yourself to fully participate in the growth of the business. So when I'm going apples to apples, fair value to fair value, I ended up with my 7.4, 7.5% rate of return. And then, of course, since this area is the dividend, this area below the white line is the dividend income. And when I stack that on top, I do it as a metaphor because what I want to show is that you got capital appreciation, which is the price going from point A to point B, but then you also additionally got this dividend income paid out to you. And that's how the performance report is talked about. So let's talk about the future. Analysts expect this company to grow at about 8.72% over the next couple of years. And again, that indicates a fair value 15 PE. That would give us a double digit rate of return, you know, assuming the company earns this money. And I do want you to notice when we look at the earnings estimates for 2023, Analysts steadily increased the estimate to 927, but they are kind of giving us a little lower estimate. Six months ago, it was 1002. The most recent estimate was 985. Now they're saying 987. So they're starting to increase it again. And, you know, with the 2025 number with only nine analysts, we also see a pretty steady, you know, pretty consistent. This is all within a reasonable range here. And then there's only two analysts forecasting for 2026. So they're forecasting 11.9, and that's actually increased from six months ago, but it's also decreased from three months ago. 
from an analyst scorecard point of view, on the one-year estimate, because of the consistency of this company, with a 10% margin of error, they've only missed 8% of the time. On two-year with a 20% margin of error, they've literally you know, beat or hit estimates 100% of the time. So I also really like the analyst scorecard here. Now, if the market were to also apply the premium valuation, which is that normal multiple, which the last five years it's been 19. But let's go back to the you know, roughly 18 multiple that I showed you at the beginning here. We'll use 17 years and do 18.18. If we get a higher multiple for this stock, such as an 18 PE, then we can be looking at, you know, annualized rates of return in the, you know, 2017 to 20% range, especially, you know, looking out two years, it'd be 20% annualized. And so I think with the quality of this company, the predictability of the company's dividend, this looks very, very attractive to me right now. I finally like it because it's come into fair value. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I was going to provide a bonus. And what I've done is... I've gone into the consumer discretionary auto parts sector and GPC falls into that category, but it's a little more diversified than the other auto parts and equipment companies. They're more niche, unlike Magna, I think, does dimming mirrors, et cetera. But I wanted to show you this because from a standpoint of dividend yield, when I look at highest to lowest, genuine parts comes in at second at 2.66% current dividend yield. The highest dividend yield is Magna International. When I look at earnings yield and I put it in order, GPC comes in last at 6.51%, but that's, again, expected for this conservative company. All of them have investment-grade credit ratings. They're all triple B except Magna, which, by the way, is a Canadian company, has an A-minus rating. The dividend compounded growth rate for these companies, Genuine Parts has, has the lowest number, but again, it's the most predictable, as I'll show you here in a moment, because it's one that they've paid one for 67 consecutive years. And none of these other three can show you that. All right. So looking at this from you know this perspective here, earnings growth for genuine parts is going to be the lowest of the three. All right. And you know an annualized rate of return is going to be the lowest of the four. The lo I said three, lowest of the four. But now let's go ahead and let's put these in alphabetical order. And let's look at these. this bonus section. These are additional companies in this sector. And I have a couple of things I want to point out. So starting out with auto leave, I want you to notice the analysts are very, very sanguine about this company's growth prospects going forward. The forecasting growth for this company is over 22%. That would give you the ability to be generating you know, 45 to 60% annualized rate of returns if the company generated these kind of earnings and if it traded at a P.E. ratio equal to the growth rate, which is what a high growth situation like this would indicate. But I want to point out this has been a very cyclical company. They've cut their dividend several times in the past, and we don't have anywhere near the predictability. They have approximately the same dividend yield, and they have a higher earnings yield and a lower valuation currently and higher expected future growth rate. They even have less debt, but there's a big difference. This is more for the investor who's looking for you know, over the intermediate term, a total rate of return. Now, even though the analyst estimates are very high here, I also want you to notice on a one-year forward estimate, analysts have missed it 42% of the time, and they've missed it 25% of the time on a two-year estimate. So as exciting as this company looks, and I do think it's exciting, and I do think it can be very interesting, it doesn't have the same investment objective as the genuine parts that I've been showing does. So that's auto leave. Next, we're going to go ahead and just relook at genuine parts. This has the most consistency, the most predictable dividend, but not necessarily the highest growth rate. Lear Corporation is another auto parts company. Now, I'm going to call out a couple of C-U-L-L, call out a couple of aberrant numbers here. This has been about a 10% grower. It's expected also to have a very high growth rate going forward. The analyst estimates one but and this accuracy of estimates, again, has been nowhere near as consistent as we saw with general parts. But again, it would have the potential to generate a much higher rate of return, at least over the short run. But I do want to point out the cyclical nature of this company and the cyclical nature of their dividend record. It's different strokes for different folks, different horses for different races. And, you know, then finally, let's look at Magna International. And let's go ahead and bring this out total because Magna International had, you know, some trouble during the Great Recession, 
but they've been back on track and they have a pretty good record since coming out of the Great Recession of increasing the dividend every year. The stock typically trades at about 11 multiple over recent years. It's trading at 9.8 times earnings now, has the highest dividend yield. It is A-minus rated and has only 29% debt. From a forecasting point of view, again, we're expecting almost 20% growth, 19% growth going forward. But once again, we see an analyst scorecard that is nowhere near as attractive and predictable as we saw with genuine parts. So what I've done here with this is I've created this portfolio for you. And the idea was that these are all companies in the auto parts sector, including genuine parts. They have a major, you know, division in the auto parts sector. You can look at that. So, you know, these other three companies have different characteristics and different, you know, metrics from a historical point of view, as well as going forward point of view. I do find it interesting that the analysts like this company now. Also, finally, the final step with FastGraphs, you can go directly into the external links and go directly into the company and learn a great deal about the company. You can also go into other external links like Morningstar and read if you're a subscriber, which I am, and you can read, you know, more things about the company. You know, like they mentioned, despite frequent acquisitions, which I mentioned earlier, it's run very conservatively and the firm reduced leverage further during the pandemic. Net debt averaged two and a half times, adjusted EBITDA from 2017 falling to 1.2 times in 2020. So they do give it a narrow moat, which is actually a good thing. And Morningstar gives it a four-star rating and a fair value of 161. And the stock currently trades at 141. So again, it's in a really good fair value range. So anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGrass, the fundamentals analyzer software tool, bringing you genuine parts and pointing out that this is a great looking stock for those who are looking for reliable predictable, and growing income stream as we you know, navigate through this inflationary environment. The beauty of a stock like Genuine Parts is that it increases its dividend every year. And therefore, if you own it, the income you get from the company increases every year. And that helps fight inflation, as well as getting some capital appreciation potential when you buy it at fair value like it is now. The other three stocks that I listed here in the auto parts industry would be much more speculative in nature. And I want to point out that they would be for investors that had different investment objectives. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give me a like, ring the bell, subscribe to the channel. And if you own stocks, for goodness sakes, at least try our free trial of fast graphs. And there's so many exciting things that we're working on. For those of you who are subscribers, you're going to be very pleased with what you see in 2024. Thanks for watching.